Hi, I'm Jackie Stapleton and welcome to Atoll TV. If you've made it here, it means that you might just love ISO standards as much as me and you are truly interested and possibly excited about learning more about them. Well, you've come to the right place. In this video, I'm going to cover clause 9.3, Management Review. I'm going to break this clause down and turn it into something you can all understand. You'll then be able to apply this to your own organization systems and understand what the requirements will look like for you. No more guessing. Keep on watching as I can show you just how easy this is. Okay, let's get started. This clause starts off with subclause 931 general, which states top management shall review the organization's quality management system at planned intervals to ensure its continuing suitability, adequacy, effectiveness, and alignment with the strategic direction of the organization. A couple of areas stand out here for me, and these are top management and planned intervals. So let's go through them both now. Top management are the ones who are reviewing the quality management system. This is a person or people who direct and control an organization, the decision makers I always say. While top management can delegate responsibility and authority to others as described in clause 5.3, they still need to review what is going on in the system. As clause 511 states, top management is to take accountability for the effectiveness of the quality management system. Therefore, this includes being involved in the review of the system. Then the second phrase that stands out to me is planned intervals. These reviews by top management are to be conducted at planned intervals. So what exactly are planned intervals and how often are they? Well, this depends on risk. Obviously, the higher risk of any actions or impacts to the quality management system, the more often these planned intervals are. I often see that with newly implemented quality management systems, the planned intervals for management review are more often. This is because it is a new system. There are still a lot of changes and possibly more work to be done to get the system firstly up and running and then to maintain it and address any gaps. Once the system has matured and it has been through several internal and external audits with minimal findings, then these planned intervals can be further apart. The timeframes I see with my clients are anywhere between monthly, quarterly, or even annually. I also have clients that determine the next management review, that is the next planned interval, at the conclusion of the current review. They base the next review on what actions there are and the risk of any areas discussed. So if they identified a high risk area that needed immediate action, they may decide to review again in a short time frame. Or if the last review was fairly uneventful, then they might decide to push it out a few months. This is still meeting the requirement of planned intervals. We can now move on to the next subclause of 932 Management Review Inputs. This subclause starts off with stating, the management review shall be planned and carried out, taking into consideration, A, the status of actions from previous management reviews, and B, changes in external and internal issues that are relevant to the quality management system. This means that each management review is not a single or silo event. Previous review actions must feed into the next review. It's an ongoing process. And of course, if there have been any changes that influence the business and therefore the quality management system, this is the place to bring them up. These changes could be customer requirements, suppliers, workers, legislation, anything that you identified as the internal and external context of the business way back in clause 4.1. 
be sure to check that video out. Then this subclause moves on to list quite a few other areas that need to be taken into consideration, which is stated as C, information on the performance and effectiveness of the quality management system, including trends in one, customer satisfaction and feedback from relevant interested parties, two, the extent to which quality objectives have been met. Three, process performance and conformity of products and services. Four, non-conformities and corrective actions. Five, monitoring and measurement results. Six, audit results. And finally, seven, the performance of external providers. Each of these requirements can be referred back to their own clauses within ISO 9001. By understanding each of these requirements from their own clause will help you to review and determine the information and trends, positive or negative, to help you out. I will share the relevant clauses that I recommend you check out. So number one, customer satisfaction is clause 912. Quality objectives is clause 6.2. Process performance and conformity can be tracked back to clause 8.1, operational planning and control, and even clause 9.1, monitoring, measurement, analysis, and evaluation. Non-conformities and corrective actions are addressed in clause 8.7, control of non-conforming outputs, and clause 10.2, non-conformity and corrective action. Monitoring and measurement results go back to clause 9.1, which is monitoring, measurement, analysis, and evaluation. The audit results are clause 9.2, internal audit, which provide detail on the requirements, processes, and outputs leading to audit results. And finally, the performance of external providers relates back to clause 8.4, control of externally provided processes, products and services. This is a three-part clause that goes into great detail about what needs to be in place and then the performance of external providers can be reviewed. There are now just three more considerations for this subclause, which are D, the adequacy of resources, E, the effectiveness of actions taken to address risks and opportunities, and F, opportunities for improvement. Top management need to also review whether there are sufficient resources to maintain and improve the performance of the quality management system. Resources can be people, equipment, hardware, software, tools, and communication requirements. To assist in understanding this, refer to clause 7.2, competence. Then in clause 6.1, actions to address risks and opportunities, the output was to integrate any actions into the quality management system and evaluate them. This feeds perfectly into management review. And then the final input is to consider opportunities for improvement. There is also clause 10, improvement. However, as far as I'm concerned, each clause requirement throughout ISO 9001 offers opportunities for improvement. You can see that all of these areas for input into management review come from an existing clause within the standard, which makes sense, of course. We are reviewing the system. The system has been developed from the standards clause requirements. This is one of the final loops in the process of review. So, by understanding all of those other clauses that I've pointed you to, then you will understand what or how to review the outputs. The final subclause is 933, Management Review Outputs. This subclause states, the outputs of the management review shall include decisions and actions related to A, opportunities for improvement, B, any need for changes to the quality management system. C, resource needs. Simple, now that all of the inputs from subclause 932 have been reviewed, 
there should be some outputs, shouldn't there? The outputs would be actions to take, identification of changes that result in improvements of the quality management system, and even operations. Actions may also require additional or new resources as well. Then most importantly, the final sentence of this clause states that the organisation shall retain documented information as evidence of the results of management reviews. Brilliant. This means that everything that was reviewed, discussed and resulted in actions should be recorded, written down, typed up, whatever this might look like for you. There needs to be evidence that this review was conducted. The most common method of evidence or recording I see for this are meeting minutes. You could actually do up a meeting agenda and include all of those input requirements from subclause 932 and then record the outcomes and actions to produce meeting minutes. Now, I do want to make clear that nowhere in this clause does it state that this management review is a meeting. Top management can review any of these inputs in any way relevant to them or the business. All I'm saying that in most situations that I come across, management review is normally some sort of meeting with meeting minutes as the evidence. Thank you so much for joining me. Clearly you are truly dedicated to learning more about ISO standards. I love having you learn with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Auditor Training Online is a recognized training provider and we know how it works in the real world. So we are confident that we can help you to make a change in your life and join the most sought after profession out there. Go to our website and enroll in our training to transform your work and industry experience into a recognized qualification and career. And also, don't forget to subscribe to Atoll TV and leave a comment or question as I truly do want to help you to join the best career out there with me. Mm -hmm.